All right. Thank you, everybody, for coming to the late afternoon session. We're going to be engaging, and we're going to keep you. We're going to keep you alert. And I hope you've had some coffee too. I know it's been a wonderful, wonderful uh, first day of the conference, and it's so good to see you again. I've been talking to a couple of you, like, oh, I know you guys. Your your face on a screen, and you're you're here, and you're human. So. Um, it's good to see everybody. If you don't know me, I'm Susanna Ural. I'm the director of the University of Southern Mississippi's Center for Digital Humanities. I'm also a professor of history here um, at the university. And I'm glad you could join us for this session on digital history, Mississippi history, and archival projects. We organized this roundtable to spotlight some of the great digital humanities work that is happening in our state and region. For those of you new to digital history or digital humanities, DH, at its simplest form, blends computing tools with humanities resources and research to enhance our ability to analyze and interpret those materials and often to improve access to them. This can involve large or small archival collections like you'll hear about today. It can focus on literary, textual analysis, for example, or it can be grounded in discussions via podcasts, blogs, or digital publications. It can be visualization efforts, like the ones my students are working on this month, creating digital maps of the Vicksburg campaign and of the process of emancipation in Mississippi during and after the Civil War. Now keep in mind, as flashy as DH can be, it's not about the flash. It's about improving the quality and strength of scholarship, and it's about making source material more accessible. And that doesn't mean that it's about 2000, 2001, and you just put, put a whole bunch of documents online. Um, you know, you have to be able to find what's out there, and that's, that's what I mean by, you know, when I use words like discoverability and accessibility. So in some ways, I guess the way I would want people to think about DH is on one hand, it's just another tool. It's just another historical tool of analysis and interpretation, but it's an important and very effective tool in our increasingly digital age. And I'm proud to say it's making significant contributions to historical inquiry in our state, the region, and around the world. Now I want to introduce our panelists in the order that they'll be speaking and that you see them in the program. First over here is Joseph Gerald. He's a graduate assistant in USM's Center for Digital Humanities. Joseph earned his BA in history at USM and he's currently working on his MA, also in history but with an emphasis on medieval culture. Joseph successfully completed the DH courses we offer here and he'll be earning USM's DH badge upon graduation. These classes are where he obtained the skills necessary to manage various projects for the DH Center and to be part of our development. Next over is Elizabeth LeBeau, one of my partners in crime on multiple DH projects. Uh, Elizabeth is the digital lab manager for the University of Southern Mississippi and the assistant director of the Mississippi Digital Library. She holds an MLIS, a certificate in archives and special collections, the digital archives specialist certificate from the Society of American Archivists, and is a Library of Congress trained digital preservation topical trainer. She served on the National Digital Stewardships, Stewardship Alliance's Levels of Preservation Revision Subgroup and the Levels of Preservation Implementation Subgroup. Elizabeth specializes in digital preservation, project planning and implementation, and copyright as it pertains to digital collections. Next over is Jennifer McGillan. She's been the coordinator of manuscripts at Mississippi State University Libraries since 2015. She received a BA in English from Davidson College, an MLIS in Archives from the University of Pittsburgh, and a JD from New York Law School. She's an active, I know, it's, she's just, you know. <laughs> we're just waiting for the MD, I mean. Really. <laughs> so I tell everybody, I'm not that kind of doctor, but I'll take a look. <laughs> she's an active participant in the development of Mississippi State's digital collections. Her current research projects include the Lantern Project that you'll be hearing about today, a multi-state and multi-institution project to digitize and transcribe legal records of enslaved persons in Mississippi and Alabama 
generous, generously funded by the National Historical Publications and Records Commission of the National Archives. Joining us online today via Zoom, thank heavens for Zoom, right? We, didn't, we don't always feel that way. But in moments like this, when our friends from Oxford can't come down to in person, um, thank heavens for Zoom. So first I want to introduce Abigail Norris Davidson. She is, yep, she's waving there. She is the Digital Initiatives Librarian and, and Assistant Professor at the University of Mississippi, where she manages the university's institutional repository, eGrove. She earned her Master of Science and in Information Studies from the University of Texas at Austin, where she focused on digital scholarship and preservation. In addition to Dear Mr. Meredith, the project she'll be talking about today with Adam, Abigail oversees several other digital projects, including Mapping Memphis, a geospatial analysis of historical funeral home records in Memphis, Tennessee, which you can find online, and I won't be mad if you pick up your phones, mapping-memphis.com. Also joining us is Adam Clemens. Can I jump over to Adam? I'm going to ask, can you do that while I talk? Adam Clemens is a research and instructional librarian and assistant professor also at the University of Mississippi. He serves as a subject specialist for history, African American studies, and international studies, and he co-chairs the library's digital scholarship committee. Adam holds a Master of Library Science and a Master of Arts in African Studies from Indiana University, as well as a Master of Arts in African Studies, well, excuse me, as well as a Master of Arts in History from the University of Central Arkansas. In addition to his work, on the Dear Meredith Digital Humanities Project, Adam recently completed an environmental scan of digital scholarship activity at the University of Mississippi, along with his library, of co library colleagues, the results of which are being used to enhance library support for research that utilizes digital scholarship methods and tools. All right, you've met everybody. Now let's get to the fun stuff. What I've asked everybody to do is just to take a couple minutes today to come up and talk a little bit about their own projects and really kind of tell us what are they doing and how it's how it's contributing to Mississippi history. So Joseph, do you want to get us kicked off? Come on up. Just yeah. pull it close to you. Yeah. Hold the base. Yeah. Can everyone hear me? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. How are we doing? Today? So uh, the project that uh, <laughs> weird. Yeah. <laughs> I can stay on my toes. That'll work too. So. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the project that I'm working on here at USM is called our Digital Snapshots Project, and uh, what we do is we partner with uh, Mississippi uh, Department of Archives and History. Are you talking? We're just going to say that. Say that. So, uh, <laughs> awesome, thank you. So, our Digital Snapshots Project. So what we do is we house uh, basically snapshots of collections uh, that MDAH has made available for us. And it is our intent with these to re uh, reach a wider audience. Because um, you can go to MDAH and you can find these collections yourself. And if you're an academic, you can make sense of it all and do your own research. But if the 10th grader who's learning history uh, finds these things, he's going to see some pictures from a photo album and he's going to think, that's cool, and then he's probably going to move on from it. So what we try to do here, we'll, go, we'll use the Mississippi flood as an example, is we take a handful of these photographs and we put them into collections. And we try to give them some uh, spatial information. So right here we have in or near Anguilla, Mississippi, our Corolla. And the purpose of this, again, is to make them more accessible, but also make it easier to know what you're dealing with. So 
One of the things that we'd like to do with our projects is partner with a historian. And we have the great Dr. Grivno who wrote this beautiful essay for us to put some context in for some of these photos that we have. Uh, again, this is aimed more at like a public base, um, but we also have educator resources and lesson plans so that this can be implemented in the classroom. This is digestible enough that it can be used in anywhere from K through 12th grade and even like in a college class. Uh, when I was in high school, which was some 10 years ago now, uh, history was not as involved with projects like this. It was more so copy some blue words out of the textbook and then we'll have a test at the end of the week. Implementing this in the classroom though is so much more involved and allows the students to engage with the material and learn in a much vi more vivid way than they would just by learning dates and learning names. In this you can actually have some contextualized history to look at and because it is Mississippi history, it's more relatable. So we can go back to the home page and right now we have four active exhibits. We have the Mississippi State Sovereignty Commission, the Mississippi State Department of Health Photographs, the Anti-Slavery Alphabet, and then the Mississippi River Flood. Right now we're working on another exhibit that will be launched within a month or so, and it's uh, titled The Crow Album. And it is a photo album of uh, the Montgomery family um, from Mahmoud. And it is, so, Y'all heard my intro. I'm a medievalist. It's very rare that I deal with anything Mississippi related. <laughs> if it shows up, it's groundbreaking. But for me, being able to interact with some of these documents and pictures, because we do deal with a lot of pictures, it's, it's semi-revolutionary. Uh, we, for the Crow album, have partnered with an art historian here on campus, Dr. Ewing. And what he has done is he's inspected each of the photographs in person to see, one, where they came from, and two, what kind of physical uh, alterations have been made. So in some of them, we have actual drawings and paintings added on to kind of spice up the album a little bit. And it's not just the Montgomery family. Uh, Frederick Douglass shows up in two pictures that we think were taken at the same time, but in different positions very tactfully. Then we also have uh, pictures of a spindle machine as well, and we're kind of trying to figure out how this fits into the album here. So it's interesting for us as historians to make these exhibits and interact and introduce them to the public, and I think it's even more interesting for the public to be able to experience history in this way. What kind of machines? I don't know, a spindle. <laughs> a spindle machine? Yes, sir. Thank you. And I'll mention too, the, I think the funnest thing, funnest is that a word? We're just going to go with it. I got a PhD. Um, I think one of the most enjoyable things about DH is the amount of collaboration that's involved. I mean, MDAH writes the metadata, they make these documents available, they're all online, and then we come in and kind of decide which ones we want to select with them to you know, introduce the public and really help kind of make these accessible um, and at the same time our students get some great training in DH development and design. So the next up I want to introduce, well I've already introduced, welcome Elizabeth Laveau and Elizabeth I'll put that on Mississippi Digital Library. Hopefully everyone can hear me, right? Yeah. Nice no, we can't, we can't hear you. No. Closer to the mic. Closer. 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 How's that? Yeah? Okay, cool. Hi. So, I, uh, as Dr. Ural had mentioned, my name is Elizabeth Laveau, and I serve in multiple capacities, but my capacity today that I'd like to talk to you from is my role with the Mississippi Digital Library. So, MDL is the Collaborative Digital Library for the state of Mississippi. We work with over 50 institutions of all different types of cultural heritage information to put them online and make them discoverable. 
So we provide hosting platforms for institutions who can't afford it for themselves, as well as the education and training to get started with digitization and to make your materials available online. And one of the fantastic parts that comes with this job is the myriad of different projects that we get to work with all across the state. Uh, as Dr. Earl had introduced me as her, her partner in crime, uh, criminal is probably a pretty good <laughs> explanation for that of uh, being able to kind of help these people along in whatever project they happen to be in. Uh, we really like to partner and, and help out in any way that we can. So I'd like to show a couple of things for MDL today, very quickly. So I love this. If you're talking about rare books and physical materials, technology works great. The moment you start talking about anything technology related is when it's going to fail. <laughs> True story. So uh, I kind of wanted to show a depiction here of how far reaching our institutions are, if it'll allow me to show the entire map simultaneously. You can get the idea of it's all across the state. Uh, as far reaching as we can possibly make it. We love to see that. So we partner with all of the academic institutions, uh, a variety of public libraries, historical societies, museums, um, pretty much if it's an institution that is open to the public that holds Mississippi history or a academic resource that resides in Mississippi at all, doesn't necessarily need to be related to Mississippi, um, you can find those types of materials through MDL. Uh, but as project-wise, all the various things we get ourselves into. Um, I would be remiss if I did not start with Dr. Ural's own research with the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi Project with CWRGM, which is a collaboration with MDAH uh, as well as MDL and the University of Southern Mississippi to put all of the letters and everything that was sent to the governors from all over the state um, online. MDL's role in this is to help with the metadata and descriptive information and to make the materials available online. At that point, we turn it over to the researchers to let them do the real work here and harvest those materials over for transcription and annotations and tagging and the, the rest of the wonderful things that they do. We've also been partnering with Jackson State and Harvard University to work on their Black Teachers Archive, uh, which is a new initiative that is getting off the ground, primarily digitizing um, Black Mississippi educator journals uh, to make those available and searchable, some of which the only known copies we have reside at Jackson State. I believe NDAH has some as well, but some of the most rare ones Harvard found at Jackson State. So we've been very pleased to be able to be a part of that as well. We've also had uh, a variety of projects in the past ongoing, from the Marion County Courthouse records, to bicentennial things, working with Delta State uh, with their Chinese heritage projects, Lebanese heritage projects, you name it. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah, I know we'll have time for questions, but the uh, last part I wanted to hit on real quick about how NDL can really help and partner with your institutions and any projects that you guys might have. One of the things that we do, since we everything we do, we do for free, uh, so we can't give money. We don't have any money to give. Sadly, that's everyone's issue. Um, but we can give service. So we organize our Cultural Heritage Digitization Award every year, and the application period for that will open up in October. And institutions can um, apply with their given projects, and the awardee will show up on site with all of the equipment and digitize for a full week. Normally we have about two people that scan nonstop, so we say about 80 cumulative hours of digitization work, and then we work with you to write the metadata and put it online so it's discoverable. With all of this fantastic resources online, I would, I have to say, like, it's not everything. It's impossible to digitize everything. Even if we were, tomorrow somebody would get a new donation and we'd start all over again. We call that job security. <laughs> so, um, the beautiful nature of all of this 
is that it's just meant to point researchers back to the institutions. MDL doesn't take any of the rights and responsibilities for any of these materials. They reside with the institution. So it's just meant to be a billboard for Mississippi to direct them back to you. Because as much as it's available online, and we'd like to increase that amount as much as possible, there's still going to be so much more that's going to be discoverable in archives, in museums, and in historical societies all around the state that are almost hidden if, if we don't point the researchers back to you so they can do more research. Um, Jennifer and I were talking here briefly right before the, the program, and it's with a lot of the workshops and things that we do, the whole purpose of it is to get students to realize, no, you have to go into the archives. You can't just Google everything. Google's not going to find it. Um, and there's so much more that is available out there beyond what Google can find. So we try to do our best to increase access wherever possible, but the real treasures are in your hands. Thank you very much. Everybody hear me? Okay. All right. Um, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jennifer McGillan. I'm the coordinator of manuscripts at Mississippi State. As you all know, I've been to school way too much. Um, I did actually promise myself the next time around, if I, there is one, it will be for fun. So the Lantern Project, uh, a quick summary, the purpose is to digitize, and it, this PowerPoint is also for me so I don't ramble off, uh, the purpose is to digitize and transcribe legal records of enslaved persons in Mississippi and Alabama, uh, it was, as we mentioned, generously funded by the NHPRC, or the National Historical Publications and Records Commission of the National Archives. There are six participa participating institutions, um, Mississippi State in Starkville, the University of Mississippi in Oxford, Delta State in Cleveland, the Columbus Lounge Public Library in Columbus, Mississippi, Historic Natchez Foundation in Natchez, and the Montgomery County Archives in Montgomery, Alabama. Okay, so the types of materials included in the project are um, probate records, circuit court records, and uh, per there's personal and family paper collections that, incl that include material such as wills and deeds of gift documenting the movement of individual enslaved persons within families, uh, bills of sale and receipts of sale, uh, plantation journals, and more. Basically, if it concerned an enslaved person and it was a legal document or something that could be produced in court of evidence uh, of, of that particular person being enslaved or, or in one instance of not being enslaved, we do have one instance of freedom papers that prove someone was not was a free person of color. Okay, so the purpose of this project is uh, to support African American genealogy and assist researchers with getting beyond the 1870 census uh, and make those kinds of connections that it is currently very hard to make. Um, to support research into the lives of enslaved persons uh, and how they would get caught in the machinery of the slave economy uh, and, and to try and, and bring some more uh, interest and in research there and also support research on the antebellum South and chattel slavery generally. So the, the, our expected benefits to users, uh, really we're trying to solve an access problem. Uh, so 19th century handwriting is very scribbly very hard to read. I'm sure some of us are intimately familiar with that challenge. Uh, ma many of the materials are in very fragile condition. Some of the probate records are, uh, they really are in shreds and uh, we are literally reassembling them on the scanner. Um, uh, some, some of the collections are under-processed or under-described, what I have learned. Uh, not just through this project but with previous work on, on 19th century collections is that the records that contain the records of the, or the folders that contain the records of enslaved persons are also, are often labeled business records. So if you are looking for records of enslaved persons uh, 
try the business records file before 1865. Um, and also to reduce the impact of broad geographic distribution of collections and institutions. You'll notice the institutions that are participating, they're from all across Mississippi. Uh, and, there's, and there's one sort of jog into, uh, into Alabama. And so our collections talk to each other. Uh, sometimes we are, whether we're, whether we're sharing topics, uh, there's families, there might be a branch of one family in, in Alabama and another branch in Natchez or somewhere else in Mississippi. And sometimes also we are sharing a family collection across multiple institutions. Like the Isaac Ross papers, if you want to get the full kaleidoscope of that, part of it is at Mississippi State, part of it is at the University of Mississippi, and part of it is at MBAH. That's six hours of driving. In order to in order to see all of that, so the uh, the the records of enslaved persons uh, are at Mississippi State, and they will be included in this project. But those those kinds of challenges are significant ones, and those are those are the things that we are trying to um, trying to address. This collection also, uh, in on some level, is trying to recognize um, <coughs> a different kind of impact of geography. And that is that when uh, enslaved persons were, were sold down the river, they meant our river, uh, the, the Mississippi and, and other, you know, other associated waterways. And in many of those contemporary accounts, you will stay, they, they describe it as these people, they vanish into darkness, right? Never to be seen again. And I called it the Lantern Project because this is our attempt to turn on the lights. Um, and that's it. <laughs> Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, good. <laughs> well, yeah, and yeah, this is a, a blessing and curse of, I guess, of technology. And on the one hand, we're able to join you from Oxford. And, and sorry, on behalf of both of us, we can't be there. Our schedules just wouldn't allow it. I wish we were, and hopefully in the future we can. It'd be great to meet everybody. Um, yeah, and I'm Adam Clemens, and, and my colleague Abby Norris and I have been working on uh, this project for a couple years now. Uh, dear, Ms. Uh, dear Mr. Meredith, mapping correspondence received by James Meredith during his integration at the University of Mississippi. Um, we're going to try to quickly do four things. I'm going to give you a little bit of historical context on the next slide, um, and then uh, Abby will talk a little bit about the details of the, of the uh, James Meredith collection that we have here at the University of Mississippi. Um, particularly the letters that we're using for this project. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the process uh, of building this map and our next steps. And then Abby will show you um, a little bit of the project kind of behind the scenes, uh, what we're building now with this mapping um, project. Um, you know, I think the story of James Meredith is, is fairly well known in Mississippi, but I just want to quickly touch on a couple things, uh, you know, to kind of give this some context and particularly why uh, Mr. Meredith was receiving letters uh, during this process because it captured sort of the, you know, the attention of the national, uh, of the nation, um, and to some extent the world is evidenced by some of the letters that he received. Um, but as many of you probably know, you know, he, he, he applied twice in 1961 to the University of Mississippi and was denied twice in 1961. Um, and this is all in spite of, you know, Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. Um, up to even to 1962, uh, the University of Mississippi was still only admitting white students. Um, he eventually filed suit in May of 1961, and after a long and arduous process, uh, the um, uh, U.S. Appeals Court ruled that he should be admitted, and the U.S. Supreme Court upheld that decision after the state of Mississippi challenged it. Um, and eventually, uh, we made our way to um, October 1st, 1962. But also important, as you all know, in uh, September 29th of 1962, a couple days uh, prior, uh, there was a riot broke out uh, uh, where uh, some obstructionists uh, fired shots at federal um, uh, troops, basically. And that also gets the attention. This whole process, uh, like I said, was, was covered at a national scale and to some extent an international scale. Um, and it led to uh, people sending letters to Mr. Meredith from around the state, around the country, and around the world. And that's the collection, uh, those letters that we have. Uh, that's what we're working from now. So, as Adam mentioned, we built this project using correspondence uh, from the James H. Meredith Collection that is housed at the University of Mississippi. We are using the digitized portion of the collection, which is housed on our institutional repository. And currently, that consists 
of about 1,500 letters that Meredith received um, during and immediately after his integration of the university. And what is currently on eGrove, we have about 1,200 letters in support of the integration and almost 300 letters that are against the integration. Um, and it's a very interesting contrast to look at the letters um, and you know what they say and who is saying them. And as I was working with this collection in the repository, I began to notice a lot of return addresses. And so I began wondering what the geographic distribution of these letters was, who was sending them, who was aware of what Meredith was doing around the world. Um, and then also wondered if we took these letters and mapped them, would the collection and would where the letters came from kind of challenge the narratives of who you would think would send pro letters and who you think would send anti letters. Um, being from the South, I'm sure we can all imagine, you know, much of the world would be prone to think that, you know, the South would just be incredibly anti and the North would be incredibly pro. And I kind of wanted to take the opportunity to see if that was true or if, as both Adam and I imagined, um, the case was a lot more complicated than that. Okay. Yeah, and so part of the process then is, as Abby was describing, you know, noticing these um, return addresses, which is, you know, the key um, for being able to map out these letters. The, the most important component is uh, in order for a letter to be included, we need to have the return address naturally. And um, the next step was we began to transcribe and assign metadata. Some of the letters were already, um, had already been transcribed. Um, and then once that was completed, we began to input them uh, on into a map based on return address and, and sentiments of the anti-pro um, sentiment. And we also had a graduate student from uh, Southern Miss uh, over the summer of 21. Um, she was doing a practicum and, and helped tremendously with the organ organizing um, and also transcribing. So hopefully it was a great experience for her. It was definitely great for us. Um, for, as far as the next steps, uh, as you'll see in, uh, shortly when Abby shows you uh, the, the map itself, uh, right now we are, we're in sort of the pilot stage. We will hope to scale this up much uh, kind of further to include more of those letters, but we've got to determine a better kind of randomized sample um, approach. Right now we're relying more or less on a convenient sampling approach where it was just, you know, what was available to us or what we could quickly access just to get to kind of get a feel for this project. Um, we need to also continue to transcribe and then input into the map. Um, and then eventually we want to analyze all this, kind of alluding to what Abby was saying earlier too, that, you know, those are some of the uh, kind of theories and assumptions that we want to test, you know, does this, pan out uh, and what can the map tell us once we've been able to establish sentiment in the letters. Um, obviously, we'd like to write up some of these findings. And then also, you know, the University of Mississippi has celebrated both the 40th in 2002 and the, and the 50th in 2012, um, you know, anniversary of the integration of the University of Mississippi. Um, we want to have something, you know, to show, to celebrate um, in, se in September and October of 19, or sorry, of uh, 2022, so this year. Um, to celebrate the 60th anniversary of that really, really important event here. That's doing my link will work. Are you able to see the new screen? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Um, so as Ada mentioned, this product is still in its pilot phase. Uh, we have about 150 letters input so far. Um, and this is what we have for the United States. If we pan out, you'll see there are more letters from all around the world. Um, and one thing you probably will notice is, as I mentioned right now, the South looks um, a little anti. We chose red for um, anti and uh, kind of teal for pro. Um, and we think that there are a couple of different reasons this is happening. First, um, the initial sample set that we used for the project was a group of about 150 um, anti-letters that a business professor had had transcribed, and because he didn't transcribe the whole collection of anti-letters, we don't know what his um, reasoning behind choosing the 150 he did was. We don't know if he wanted to focus on the geographic South or if it was a random sample. And also, we currently have many, many more anti-letters already in the map um, than we do pro just because they had already been transcribed, um, and so, but, which it needs to be the opposite because there are proportionately so many more pro 
pearl integration letters that are actually in the collection. And so over the next few months, we are going to um, add a proportional number of pearl integration letters and we, um, just based on what I've seen looking through the collection, uh, predict that um, the colors behind the map and the sentiment behind the map will shift a lot. And there actually was a lot of support from the South, but you will have to check back in with us in September to see if those uh, predictions are accurate. Um, and that's all we have. Thank you so much. All right. I want to point out one thing quickly. Um, Elizabeth was good enough to mention my own project. This is the Civil War and Reconstruction Governors of Mississippi project. We have about 5,000 documents, almost 5,000 available now online. You can explore based on location, occupation, people, places, and kind of pull up the documents that are kind of especially of interest to you. Um, so let's just say we're looking for some documents from Adams County. You can scroll through here, find the documents that might be of interest if you're just kind of, if you're just teaching at a school in Adams County, if you're doing some research on Adams County, if you're interested in genealogy from Adams County, and you can see the original document transcriptions, and you can also jump with hyperlinks to any particular place, person, occupation, etc., that's mentioned in these documents. Um, I want to point out two things before we jump back to a couple questions. The first is the number of times I think we've mentioned both the NEH and the NHPRC. I also want to mention the Mississippi Humanities Council. Um, with tax season upon us, we don't always enjoy paying our taxes, but it's good to remember sometimes what those taxes go to um, and how much our state and federal level funding is, is making possible. The other thing I want to point out is that, you know, we've been talking about MDL but I also want to mention um, an organization that's near and dear to many of us, Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and how much they do at the state level that makes all of this possible. I mean, they are digitizing every single document, over 20,000 documents for our collection, as just part of what they do um, for my project alone. You know, and I know Jennifer, Elizabeth, you've mentioned them. Joey and I are working with MDAH all the time for digital snapshots, so I want to make sure proper credit is given. Now, um, I want to ask a question of Elizabeth, because if you're interested in DH and you're going after some grant funding, one of the things you have to be able to explain is how you're going to sustain your project beyond that funding. Like, how are you, how are you going to keep that material accessible, up to date? Um, and Elizabeth is my go-to person for this all the time, so I want her to talk about this a little bit. Thank you. So, yeah, that's one of the things that granting agencies are very much interested in, is they want to make sure that their investment is going to outlive the duration of their grant, right? So how you can sustain your project beyond that. They want to know clearly, like, if you're specifically putting things online, who's going to take care of the servers afterwards, who's going to maintain your websites afterwards, um, especially if you are providing additional research beyond like the documents themselves, like so MDL hosts the documents, but all of the research um, is being done on cwrgm.org, for instance. <coughs> so making sure that there's a plan that if the worst were ha to happen and funding would disappear, how is this going to maintain past that? Um, so it's very much dependent on what resources you have available to you, how you can do that, and different methodologies for doing so, but they're definitely interested in that perspective. One of the things that I advocate institutions consider is what their exit strategy is going to be, particularly for any vendors they might be working with. So if you was like, oh, I'm going to digitize all of this stuff and I'm going to... Um, Put it online with the Internet Archive. Well, Internet Archive is fantastic. I'm a big fan. It is also primarily funded by one individual. <coughs> so what happens if that one individual passes away or stops funding it? What happens to it then? Right? So those are not necessarily fun questions to ask. 
because you want to think of everything that you're doing is going to last forever, but in the technical world, technology changes all the time, right? So the websites that you're using today, what, what's that going to look like in five, ten years? All right, and next up, I want to put Joseph on the spot as our student representative who got into DH as an undergrad and a grad student, just to talk a little bit about you know, what advice you might have for undergraduate or graduate students getting interested in DH for research. Uh, I think this applies to undergrads and graduate students, but also some of our faculty too who had never experienced DH before and uh, started stopping by our office and uh, wanting to learn. And I think the, the biggest thing for me uh, would be to say, don't be afraid of it. Um, when I took the first DH class uh, this time last year, uh, the big project at the end of the semester was creating two websites. One of them, uh, a WordPress website, and then the other one is an Omeka website, which is what we use to um, show off our uh, MDAH exhibits. And I knew how to log on to Facebook, and I knew how to open my email, so when the professor said we're going to be creating websites, I considered finding another class. But I didn't. I stuck with it. And it can be a lot to look at at first, uh, and diving headfirst into it, you will get buried very quickly. Uh, but taking it in small, digestible pieces it will pay off in the long run if you're really looking to get into DH. Thank you. All right, next up, um, I want to ask our friends on Zoom here. Hold on. There we go. Um, Abby and Adam, I, I wanted to have y'all talk a little bit about project management um, because, you know, DH projects can be large, uh, they can be small, and they require, it's, it's a lot of work, right? I'll stand up so those of you can see me in the back. Um, you know, you have to digitize the documents, you have to create metadata, so who wrote it, when was it written, where was it written, how are you going to get it online, how do you partner with an institution that can maybe help. So, Abby and Adam, if you could, if you could talk a little bit about how you all handle that. Yeah, um, Abby, I can start, and if you want to add, uh, feel free. Uh, yeah, and Abby and I were just talking about this the other day, I and mean, thinking about when we started this project pre-COVID, right, the before times, um, and, you know, we never anticipated those things, and then other, you know, we've just been busy, right, and so trying to find the time to, to manage all of this has been definitely um, tricky and enjoyable. Uh, one of the things we mentioned in our presentation, and we had the fortune to have a student, uh, Rachel from Southern Miss, who really helped a lot, um, both having our co-chairs of the Digital Scholarship Committee here in the library, and we've had that conversation too about crowdsourcing with the committee members um, when we get to that next stage, when we have more letters to transcribe, um, and effectively just, you know, recruiting volunteers to help with that process. Unfortunately, we've had people help with them. Um, you, you know, we just, we're trying to think of those kinds of things, and that's why we wanted to start kind of small scale. I think that's probably crucial for for, for us, you know, before we extend to, to hopefully a much larger scale, to work out all of these various um, various details, the you know the, the procedure that we that we want to follow, the way that we want to you know um, the, the protocol for you know iterating metadata, and just making sure that we're consistent um, and that we're using the same sort of you know qualitative coding and, and, and things like that. Um, but it definitely has been. Uh, uh, a, a process, but again, we started small, and it's, and it's made, I think, in my opinion, uh, easier. Yeah, I, mean, I think, especially with a project like this, paying attention to your metadata is crucial. That's an issue that we have run into. Um, the original transcriptions were um, more typical archival transcriptions where, you know, things were noted um, in brackets and um, it wasn't necessarily as readable as something you would want to see on a website and so then you have to go make the decision, you know, do we want to keep these archival standard transcriptions or do we want people to be able to go onto the website and just read a letter verbatim. We also had to and still are having to make decisions about some of the language that appears in some of the letters. It's extremely offensive and it's, you know, do we um, kind of stick to the history of what was written or are we sensitive to the um, 
weeks and months of people who will be seeing this project and who might be triggered by some of the things people say. Um, and also things like addresses, we have to make decisions about do we go down to the exact address of people who sent these letters? Well, no, because the people who live here now were the ones that sent these letters. Um, and so it's being consistent about your metadata and making decisions at the beginning that inform, um, you know, begin with the end in mind, um, I think is a really important lesson that we have definitely learned along the way. Um, and then also making sure that you don't um, step outside the scale of what you were able to manage um, and making sure that the project stays sustainable. This is a project that could very easily become, you know, Adam and my whole job for an entire year um, if we had <laughs> the capacity to do that, but we don't. This is just a project that we do in our research hours. Um, so making sure that we have the support that we need um, and we are able to get help from crowdsourcing and outside sources when we're able to is extremely crucial to making sure this project is something that we are able to finish and share with everyone. Awesome, thanks y'all. Um, we are getting close to the end, but we started a little late, so I'm just gonna take a couple of extra minutes, but I promise not to get between you and Millsap's history department's generously hosted president's reception. I know better than to do that to all of you. Um, but I did want to just open up to a couple of questions y'all might have. Just, I want to encourage you to do this. I don't want you to get intimidated by any of this. Either one of y'all. Um, I was at your History is Lunch presentation on uh, letters to the governor. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you indicated that people that were interested in helping you, volunteers, could get online, see those, make a translation, and interpret 19th century handwriting for you and send it in. How'd that work out for you? <laughs> well, ask Dee Dee Baldwin, because we can't keep up with her. Um, literally, you know, MDAH is working like crazy, digitizing these documents and making them available. Our metadata team with MDL is writing the metadata so we can get these online. And our volunteers, including the wonderful Dee Dee Baldwin, um, but I mean, also all around the world. I mean, we literally have volunteers around the world who are transcribing these documents. Um, I can show y'all real quick here. Come here. There we go. Um, where, and a lot of projects do this, by the way. There's this little guy to get involved, and you can volunteer, and you can help us, help us transcribe these. Um, and, you know, as Abby was making that wonderful point, we transcribe documents verbatim. But we also have kind of pop-ups that appear over words that are kind of ethnic slurs, for example, or just words that just aren't used anymore to really guide students, for example, and not experts that this is the appropriate word to use in this context and things like that. So it's working wonderfully. Like I said, we have almost 5,000 of the, oh, a little over 20,000 documents are available online. Sir? I don't know. Uh, Dr. McGillan, uh, how far along are you in your project? Okay, so I'm not actually a doctor of anything, but thank you for that. Oh, oh, uh, uh, so we are, um, the, uh, this has also been a, uh, a baptism by fire in uh, managing a distributed project during a time of global crisis. So the pandemic has disrupted us a little bit, so we're not as far along as perhaps we had planned to be, because the grant was awarded uh, in December 2019. We were supposed to get started in January of 2020, and we all know what happened in March. Um, that said, uh, we have managed to do a tremendous amount of scanning, so we have a lot of scan material. Uh, we have been diligently extracting data and creating metadata. We are, everybody cross your fingers, uh, going to be having enough online to teach with this summer. So we will have enough, and this kind of goes into our other set of pre-questions, is how is anyone going to know this is happening? It, it, you'll be sick of me, I promise you, um, by, by the time we get done. Um, so we're gonna, have, we're gonna have enough online to teach with uh, by June. Um, and then we will be gradually loading things. The grant is supposed to end in December of this year. 
Uh, I am hoping we will have a significant chunk of it online. I don't know that we will have all of it online. When we all got sent home in March, I did, I did write to the NHPRC and be like, um, what do we do? And they said that you know everybody they had given grants to was in that same position and, and that they're like, just do what you can and we'll work it out. So that's kind of where we are. And the details of we'll work it out remain to be seen. But, uh, but I, I, feel, I feel like we have accomplished a lot. Uh, we, and we do have, uh, you know, our, 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 some of our partner institutions, um, nobody got sent home. Uh, and some of our partner institutions, everybody got sent home. So it was, and there's been, you know, those of us who were relying on student labor, uh, there have not been that many students on campus in some, you know, at certain points. Uh, so we have tried to, uh, to catch up um, and so on. So the short answer, I know, this is what I mean by I ramble. Uh, the short answer to your question is uh, not perhaps where we plan to be, but nonetheless in a good place. Getting the metadata and transcriptions of whole or pull or descriptive transcriptions done, summary transcriptions. A lot of these legal documents are like the aforesaid of the, who, of the heretofore, the, 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 nobody cares. Um, so we're trying to, to pull out the relevant information about the enslaved persons to be able to say, you know, this is a will in which the following people were, this is what happened to them in this will without getting into all of the dense legal language. And if you want a word for word transcription, you can email the, the participating institution and we'll figure something out. Um, but uh, anyway, so I'm sorry, does that answer the question? Okay. <laughs> We are humanists. We are people of the book. We're a little long-winded, and that's a good thing. I like it. We inform people. Any more questions from the group? Yes, ma'am. I'm just uh, wondering if historians are as concerned as I am when uh, various courthouses decide to start digitizing their records, and they have like a little introduction to the archives, and then they just run with it and talk about sustainability. I worry about it. When you say they, they kind of introduce it and then talk a little bit about it, do you mean like they're not providing enough context for what, what's available? About sustainability of these courthouse records. Oh, of, of the records themselves. That's, that's what you're bringing in sustainability. You and me both. Um, I, and, I really do. Right. And I mean, this is why about every time I give a talk, I recognize I'm DAH because we always are turning to y'all of how, who's, who's saving this stuff. I mean, the good news is um, as Elizabeth mentioned, like you can't digitize all of it, um, and even when you digitize it, it it's, it's kind of like microfilm. That that doesn't mean it's going to last forever. Um, you know, it, things disappear. I think we all know that. So, digitize it, throw it away. Digitize it. It can. They yeah. Saved. And a lot of I'm sorry. Oh, I know. No, no, no. Because again, I, I you know, if if you're not hearing it, what she's saying is. You know, once the once the courthouse feels like it's digitized, now we can make room for some other things because their mission is not necessarily what our mission is. Um, and so I know MDAH does a lot of work in trying to preserve that stuff, but I mean, you, you can only be in so many places at one time. Um, it's I, I wish I could offer something more comforting than we're fighting the good fight. Um, you know, it, in some ways, Anne, I feel like. By digitizing some of this stuff, like we, like my students did working with MDL and MDIH in Marion County, at least we're getting some of this stuff online where people can access it. Want to go to the other 81, though? <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> but I mean, look, we'll bring more people in and we'll do this. Um, but no, it's it's something that we need to talk about. DH talks about it all the time. Um, sustainability, preservation. You know, we are not the end all be all. It's it's very much a collaborative effort. Yes, ma'am. Has there been a discussion about um, the loss of records during war? I was working on a project in the Dark Ages where we lost everything because of the cold fusion. So I please listen when she says keep up with the technology. But um, there's so much. We're all watching Ukraine. What are we losing in terms of records there? And what just in this area, yeah. what has been thought about and discussed about what we have lost because of conflict? 
Right, and so Elizabeth, I'm going to turn this to you. Um, so the question was, you know, in times of war, for example, if you're looking at what's happening in Ukraine right now, like we all are, but also just in times of, of upheaval, of hurricanes, tornadoes, like what, what happens in those cases with records? Yeah, so I'll actually do a plug for one of the Library of Congress's projects that they run. Uh, it's called the World Digital Library, and fairly Googleable. And part of their mission is actually to go into these war-driven areas and try to save as much as possible as quickly as possible. Um, you know, like all of our efforts, we do the best we can. That doesn't necessarily mean they can save everything, but there are um, institutions and organizations that do focus on this particular issue. Uh, in terms of like natural disasters and protecting your thing, uh, protecting your digital materials, a good rule of thumb is multiple copies keep stuff safe. The more, especially for digital materials, the more copies of it you can save in different locations, the better off you're going to be. So if your building unfortunately burns down, do you have all of your data somewhere else? We know we have historical societies that bought a couple external hard drives. Now this is not necessarily the best, but if you have zero budget, right? Um, and each member has a, has a copy of all the digital files. So if something were to happen to their primary copy, they do at least have backups elsewhere. And now you have to make sure that those stay accurate and up to date and are still accessible and things like that. You can't just put it on a hard drive and stick it on a shelf and hope in 20 years you're gonna be able to read it. You still have to care for it like a living document. Um, but yeah, the more copies you can make of your digital materials, the better off you're going to be. Because you have something in the chat. Perfect. Hold on real quick. Abby and Adam, hold on. I'm going to stop screen sharing so that you can just talk. All right, y'all go ahead with what you were saying in the chat. Oh, I was just, yeah, and I just wanted to add to that. Um, what Elizabeth said, that there's also this uh, specialized program that the British Library that you can look at. I would put links in the chat, but the Endured Archives program and then UCLA has a really good uh, project as well, one of the Endured Archives program. They're more or less the same sort of things, but to that question of, of you know, which one areas or, or also just you know, very fragile uh, uh, collections that need uh, funding, maybe bad from institutions and places where funding is an issue, uh, they, they fund those sort of projects as well. And some of that stuff, if you search, say, UCLA's program, you can see some of the work that they're doing all across the world on a global scale. All right, y'all. We could talk about this all evening, but there's a reception to get to. So what I'm going to do is ask the panelists to stay up here for a little bit, um, just in case anybody has individual questions. But thank you all so much. Thank you, Abby and Adam online, and have a wonderful evening.